But I am curious this morning, have you ever gotten a text that uh, just kind of stopped you in your tracks? Because that's what happened with the text message that Jamal sent me. It was just a few weeks ago, and, and I was having a stressful moment. And Jamal, being the good friend that he is, gave me some much-needed outside perspective. Jamal realized that in this moment, I couldn't see the big picture. And so he pointed out to me, he said, there's a piece that wasn't there before, an ease that no longer has to come the hard way. The church has made you purpose-driven and a much happier person. And so I'm wondering, well, first of all, it's no casual observation because Jamal has known me far longer than I've been coming to UUCA. And perhaps one of the reasons that the message struck me was actually how the sentiment in one of the songs mirrors a line from For Good, which Laura and Don just sang for us earlier. Perhaps that line stands out to you too. But because I knew you, I have been changed for good. But because I knew you, I have been changed for good. That line reminds me how our relationship with you, my relationship with you and our shared experiences have shaped me for the better, which is what Jamal is saying. That line is an affirmation of the transformation that occurs when others touch our lives, and in turn, we touch the lives of those around us. And as I read Jamal's message, it was as if a key had turned in a lock, opening the door to an undiscovered room. Despite my stress, he saw the undercurrent of immense joy that I'd been able to tap into over the last few years. He'd, he'd, his insight reflected what I'd already discovered, my purpose, and thus the joy witnessed was found in being a part of something bigger than myself, this church, this community. Today, I am actually, I'm super eager to share with you the potential of unlocking your power of purpose, just as I have. Now, I want you to think, have you ever had moments when you, like me, you were chasing happiness only to return empty-handed? I don't think it's something unique to me. I, I think it's something that we've all shared at some point or another, isn't it? I mean, Jamal was right. Since coming to UUCA, I have learned to listen. I have Learn to judge less, and I've grown more aware of the very paths that each one of us tread. Some, like mine, are clear and open, while others, they're obstructed by prejudice. And now that I recognize my privilege as a white male born into and identifying with my assigned gender, I'm committed to using that advantage in a straightforward and effective way to champion fairness and inclusion for all. And with you, I've, I've learned some deep strengths, real strength. It isn't about control, it's about resilience, it's about adaptability, and vulnerability, it's not a, weaken, a weakness, it's a testament to our shared humanity. Through this journey, I've learned to embrace vulnerability. When my energy is depleted, a concept that the old me would have fought, truth and now. And in the journey, I've discovered an unexpected gift. I've found happiness, not in accumulating money or possessions or awards, but in the deep, lasting joy from self-service, selfless service. Each act is done for others, but it enriches my life in ways that I never could have imagined. So as we bark on an exploration of purpose, I invite yourself to ask a question. What? If the secret to my utmost fulfillment and happiness isn't in the relentless pursuit or hunt for individualism, but the shared purpose and mission that's achieved through serving in collective community. The pursuit of happiness it's a, and the pursuit of purpose it's a justice that's, a well, that's well trodden. Many folks before us have transformed their lives and those of others in ways that have paved the future for generations that would come to live more fully. And as we delve deeper into our service today, I'm going to extend an invitation. I'm going to extend a call to action. And this invitation, it's not some magic trick. It echoes the sincerity of Jamal's heartfelt text to me. It's not a ploy to coax or to cajole you. It's just a call to purpose and to embrace it and see the power that can spring from that call. This appeal, it comes from my deep admiration and respect for each of you. It is born from the countless moments of shared joy, resilience, and transformation that I've seen in you. 
Now, whether you accept or decline the invitation that I'm going to give you, I want that decision to be guided by your convictions, just as mine has been. So, I want to be completely transparent, though. I'm going to do my best to convince you that you are perfectly positioned to accept my invitation. There should be no question of that when I'm finished. There should be no question, and I'm going to be as persuasive as I possibly know how to be because I want to convince you that this quest will change your life for the good. But hey, as Unitarian Universalists, I know you're not going to fall for any mental jujitsu. You're savvy folks, so, um, so we're all on the same page, right? When I extend my invitation, your yes or your no will reflect your convictions. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Friends. Our journey, it has been one heck of a ride, hasn't it? Oh my gosh. I mean, we have weathered turbulent times, to say the least, political upheavals, pandemic challenges, societal shifts, and somehow, somehow we found the time for an existential crisis or two. (laughs) Amidst this, I just want you to know that I have been privileged to share space with you. I've witnessed your unwavering ability to listen, to empathize, and to support each other as true servant leaders our climate action team's passionate dedication for our earth, the Memorial Garden Committee's care for our ancestors who are forever entwined in this sacred space, the relentless support for homeless advocacy and undocumented immigrants, and the ongoing efforts to assist underprivileged children in our area, each act of compassion never failing to amaze me. From our toll-free pastoral care line to our baking ministry, which bakes pound cake so delicious it feels like a hug, Oh, you know what I'm talking about. And did you know that our caregivers team takes that pound cake and they deliver it to homebound congregants? When I say I see you, I really do. I see the incredible compassion and community that you nurture through your actions, your gatherings, and your collective endeavors. Within our beloved UUCA, we have over 30 groups that are flourishing, each contributing unique threads to our vibrant tapestry. And though we can't name each one today, I want you to know that your dedication and your passion, they move me. Together, all of us, we are continually creating a sanctuary of love, hope, Reverend Baird, and action. As we gather here today, I want you to know that you hold a special place in my heart, and that is the reason that I serve. Let's add some perspective and depth to this story, though. I mean... The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta has been here for 141 years. But I want to focus on just the last five. Because just this last five years, it's been an odyssey. It's required immense sacrifice and courage. And yet through it all, we have grown stronger, more compassionate, and more unified. Would you agree? On March 12th, 2018, we decided to part our beloved home at Cliff Valley Way a sanctuary of shared memories, growth, joy, sorrow, so that the land could find a new purpose as a children's hospital. The parting was bittersweet for every corner of that space held a shared piece of our history. Our new home, a mundane office park, was a stark contrast. (laughs) I mean, it was an unexpected pit stop. It tested our faith, our resolve. We called it the tree house because we could actually see branches between the metal blinds on the (laughs) second story windows. But I've often wondered, was there a deeper acknowledgement of our unforeseen journey roaming in the wilderness? Was that why we called it the tree house? Because we found our congregation in Exodus for nearly four years, wandering and yearning for a permanent home. And during this transitional phase, we faced yet another trial the unexpected departure of our senior minister of 12 years. We were put in the barely conceivable position of needing to search for both a home and a senior minister, which could have been a recipe for disaster. But our resilient and proactive community saw the beacon of hope that was in our own Reverend Taryn. Our congregation, demonstrating profound wisdom, swiftly made her our senior minister This wasn't merely a promotion. I believe that it was an astute strategic move, a clear testament to our faith and her leadership. And with her unwavering grace, her inspiring vision, Reverend Taryn led us through the wilderness, her resilient spirit sparking hope amidst the challenges at hand and those yet to come. In this uncharted territory, we continue to defy the odds, 
Do you all remember this little gym? We hired a well-known fundraising consultant to come in, and they did, delivered woefully dour news that we weren't going to come nearly close enough to create our new home, to renovate our new home. And then almost simultaneous to that news, what happened? The world, it shut down due to COVID-19. What was our response? Resilience. That was our response, resilience. We would go on to astound them by raising $4.2 million amidst a global pandemic. I mean, we did what they said we couldn't. We raised $2 million more than their prediction. Quite a feat, I'd say. And with these funds and the support of our endowment committee, we built this. We built this, our new church campus. It's a physical manifestation of the dedication to radical welcome, to accessibility and inclusivity. From pandemic-related labor shortages to supply chain disruptions, we navigated and we overcame every challenge before us. I mean, you've all demonstrated, you have demonstrated the remarkable power of collective action through your commitment to a shared vision. And here we are. Here we are on July 23rd, 2023, basking in the comfort of this beautifully renovated sanctuary nestled on our 4.2 acre campus and it feels pretty darn good, doesn't it? It feels good, but as we sit here now enjoying the fruits of our shared labor, I do believe a question persists, a question of purpose, a question that begs, what's next? What new challenge awaits us on our shared path forward? Well, I'll give you a chance to kind of contemplate that question. What new challenge awaits us on our shared path forward? I, I believe the answer is likely tightly, is tied squarely to the harsh realities confronting us. You already know we're grappling with the surge of nationalism, threatening to undercut our fundamental freedoms. Anti-LGBTQ plus legislation in all of its forms bombards us. It seems to forget the lessons of the past. And as I stand here in 2023, it is disheartening to see the disparity between the march of time and the backpedaling of social norms. Anti-LGBTQ legislation, it casts an ominous shadow over most of our states. And as your proud out and gay guest preacher here this morning, it's incumbent upon me to ensure that you understand the gravity of what we're up against. Already this year, a staggering 41 states have proposed measures aimed at marginalizing and alienating me and my LGBTQ plus siblings. Do you hear me? I mean, we started this country with only 13 colonies, yet today we find ourselves with only nine states refraining from proposing any of the 525 anti-LGBTQ bills this year. And even more disheartening, a record-breaking 80 of these bills have already become enacted in just these last few months. It's not that they're just proposing them, they are enacting them. We also, we can't overlook the interconnectedness of these assaults. Tennessee and Florida, for instance, They've manipulated legislation to muzzle our educators. They're barring them from acknowledging the struggles and achievements of the LGBTQ plus community. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, he waves his Don't Say Gay bill as a campaign trophy. It's a flagrant affront to the dignity and rights of our interweave community. This disturbing tide of vitriolic political posturing, it inflicts real harm on real people. I've had friends resort to self-harm and commit the worst to escape the relentless judging and persecution. And today I'm here preaching my heart out to you because I'm saying to you it's simply untenable. Amen? Amen. This encroachment, it extends beyond individuals. It's reaching into the realms of education and health care. There's a disconcerting trend to re-whitewash history. Do you hear me? I said re-whitewash history, erasing the diverse stories that truly shaped our nation, banning the teaching of black and civil rights history, and perpetuating systemic oppression. But it doesn't stop there. It's also an insidious attempt to obscure the richly woven tales of our Asian and Latino communities. Current events reveal a stark and unacceptable reality because their stories, too, are being squeezed out. Their contributions conveniently forgotten, their struggles dismissed. Yet these are the stories that have given color and depth to our shared American tapestry. They deserve to be told, they must be heard and remembered 
They can't be buried underneath a single dominating narrative. Meanwhile, vital services like gender affirming and abortion care are being cut, leaving vulnerable communities without critical support and personal autonomy. According to the Human Rights Campaign, these incidents, they're not random. They represent a carefully coordinated attack orchestrated by a network of conservative organizations that are supplying cookie cutter. I mean, they're literally copying and pasting legislative weaponry and putting it up for vote in our state houses. And amidst these tempests, with all of that going on, the United States Supreme Court has become complicit, aiding and abetting the erosion of our rights. Present rulings have permitted the denial of service to LGBTQ plus individuals. They trampled the landmark ruling of Roe versus Wade. They've dismantled affirmative action in university admissions and rejected student debt relief. Who do these actions hurt? These actions only deepen systemic inequalities. They hinder progress for our marginalized communities. Breathe, right? <laughs> Breathe. You know, this isn't a call to panic. It's not an attempt to sensationalize reality, but it is us facing the harsh truths of our current re reality, our current world. Yet even in these stormy times, I do want to let you know there are rays of hope. For every place like Florida, a Michigan is championing non-discrimination protections for our LGBTQ friends. Thank you. <laughs> and for every Georgia that's firing a teacher for reading books like My Shadow is Purple, which we read earlier, which Shay read, and Illinois is banning the banning of books. And y'all, I think it's important to let us take a moment to appreciate the incredible legacy that we have right here at UUCA. Over a century ago in 1894, this congregation consisted of passionate abolitionists fighting for freedom and suffragists advocating for women's rights. A half century later, in 1954, this church made history by becoming the first integrated congregation in Atlanta. It was a groundbreaking move that removed barriers. And alongside St. John's Episcopal in Montgomery, Alabama, our two churches were the first integrated congregations in the entire South. That was this congregation. We are a people of immense courage. In the 1960s, the Atlanta City Council refused to let us build a church in the city limits, a new church in the city limits, because of our integration. They pushed us to DeKalb County, but that didn't stop us. We were determined to keep going. And even when faced by a Ku Klux Klan mob trying to disrupt our integrated Sunday school with Ebenezer Baptist Church, the people of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta encircled the church. They stood strong and they stood together. Our pulpit... It's been filled by luminaries like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator John Lewis. And as I stand here today, I want you to feel the weight of that remarkable legacy. It's an honor, my friends, to work here and to be a part of a legacy that's so truly special. But again, I come back to that question. I ask, what is next for us? Our first uh, principle in Unitarian Universalism, recognizing a person's inherent worth and dignity, anchors our sh shared commitment to justice. This belief in a diverse and interconnected community is expressed not just in our words, but in our actions. Is this not our clarion call? We absolutely should ask ourselves, what stops us from being a beacon of change in these challenging times? Can't we transform our campus into a home for community organizing? Could this campus be a training ground for social justice leaders, much as our Appalachian neighbors, the Highland Folk School, did during the Civil Rights Movement? Are these acres of land not able to provide sustenance, a flourishing community garden for those in our area? We stand on the shoulders of the Unitarian Universalists who came before us. They brought lasting change. And what did I tell you earlier? I told you that I see you. I see you every day. In fact, I have the best seat in the house for witnessing you. And I believe in my heart that you are cut from the same cloth as the UUs who came before. Their legacy, it thrives within us. And I'm preaching and I'm proclaiming today that we too can shape this world for the better. So today, let's open our hearts and consider what actions that we as a congregation can do to counter 
the rise in anti-LGBTQ legislation? How can we ensure that African American history is represented fully and truthfully in our schools? How can we amplify our voices against the unjust reality of mass incarceration? And importantly, how can we champion the rights and accessibility for our disabled siblings, not just in this sanctuary, but in every aspect of society? We are confronted with a multitude of injustices, and while we cannot tackle everything at once, we can identify the intersecting areas where these issues, and then we can discern where it is that our collective passions lie. So today, I challenge you. I challenge you to believe me when I say to you that we are poised to take on a singular significant challenge right now, an effort that will involve this entire congregation. That is the gist of the invitation that I told you earlier I would propose. But my actual proposal, it's, it's more inviting. I'm actually only asking, are you willing to embrace the possibility? Friends, our congregation, it's extraordinary because of you, the exceptional individuals that constitute another emergency. <laughs> Management alert. I'm going to go back just a second. Because this is important, friends. Our congregation, it's extraordinary because of you, the exceptional individuals that constitute it. Time and again, we've demonstrated that change is possible both within our sanctuary and well beyond. And as we stand today at the brink of new challenges, I implore you to embrace purpose, the very same purpose that has given me the deep and enduring joy I shared with you today at the start of this journey. Imagine our collective potential if instead of relentlessly seeking material happiness, we all just chose to let purpose guide us, and in so doing, we allowed happiness to find us. When the religious rights, when the religious right targets the marginalized, Unitarian Universalism, it offers the antidote. We offer hope. We ally ourselves with justice. We deliver a message of acceptance and a love that will endure if we proclaim it boldly. Silence, my friend, is not an option. They are too loud, and our voices cannot be left to be drowned out. There is simply too much on the line for us to sit here comfortably. I stand here to say with utmost certainty that you are indeed the right people in the right place at the right moment in this crucial time. As we grapple with the challenges that we discuss today, let's remember our strengths. Let's remember our victories in this home that we've built. It stands as a testament to our capability and who we are as a congregation, a community of extraordinary individuals sparking remarkable change. Our shared purpose, it enriches lives and brings an unexpected reward, deep and enduring happiness, a joy that emanates from service, understanding, and love. Happiness that stems from purpose. And that is the invitation that I extend to you today. The only question left is, will you say yes?